Hello class, in this particular lesson we are going to cover the last part of lesson 13, Hot Zones in the Cold War. We're going to start with the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cold War confrontation between the United States and Cuba, 1959-1962. Cuba was also the site of major Cold War confrontations. Fidel Castro led a communist revolution over the Batista regime that took over Cuba in the late 1950s under the control of communism. Many Cubans that did not want to live under communist regime fled to Florida and later attempted to invade Cuba and overthrow Castro in the failed Bay of Pigs invasion that was supported by President John F. Kennedy. In 1962, the Soviet Union stationed nuclear missiles in Cuba, instigating the Cuban Missile Crisis. President John F. Kennedy ordered the Soviets to remove the missiles, and for 13 days the world was on the brink of nuclear warfare. Eventually, the Soviet leadership blinked under the leadership of Nikita Khrushchev and removed the missiles. Here we have communist dictator and leader of the Communist Revolution, Fidel Castro. This is a top secret document that has been declassified that shows the location of the missile silos outside of Havana and their ability to strike every major American city with the exception of Seattle and obviously cities in Alaska and Hawaii. This is the images taken by the U-2 spy plane of the launch sites and silos um, outside of Havana and Cuba. Here we have John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy, uh, who served as Attorney General, very famous image taken during the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is a cover of Life magazine of the failed Bay of Pigs invasion that was an American-backed attempt for Cuban refugees to try to retake the retake Cuba from Castro. It was backed by the CIA and the failure was ultimately thrust upon President John F. Kennedy who took full responsibility for giving the go-ahead on the Bay of Pigs invasion. How America's military forces defended freedom during the Cold War. In President John F. Kennedy's inaugural address, he pledged that the United States would pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe in order to assure the survival and the success of liberty. In the same address, he also said, Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Obviously, Kennedy had been a civil servant in his own right. He had served in the U.S. Navy during World War II. During the Cold War era, millions of Americans served in the military, defending freedom in wars and conflicts that were not always popular. Many were killed or wounded. As a result of their service, the United, States of, the United States and American ideals of democracy and freedom ultimately prevailed in the Cold War struggle with Soviet communism. This is John F. Kennedy's inauguration. Here we have the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C. I highly recommend you get the opportunity to go to D.C. And, and check out the war memorials that are located along the National Mall located uh, between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument. Americans sacrifice during the Cold War. President Kennedy, World War II veteran of the Navy, as I mentioned, was assassinated in 1963 in Dallas, Texas, an event that shook the nation's confidence and began a period of internal strife and divisiveness, especially spurred by divisions over 
the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War. Unlike veterans of, of World War II who returned to a grateful and supportive nation, Vietnam veterans re often return to face indifference or outright hostility from many who oppose the war. The tr even greater tragedy of that is that a significant amount of the v Vietnam War veterans who served were drafted and did not enter into the service voluntarily. It was not until several years after the end of the war that the wounds of the war began to heal in America and Vietnam veterans were recognized and honored for their service and sacrifice. And as previously mentioned, I would strongly recommend any Virginian um, or American for that matter, or anyone, um, take the opportunity to visit the Virginia War Memorial in Richmond, Virginia. It's, a, it's an amazing and, and very humbling experience. Here we have the images of John F. Kennedy and his wife, Jackie, um, just moments before the assassination. This is uh, Oliver Stone film, Born on the Fourth of July. Uh, this was Tom Cruise's first film. The reason I point out this, this film in particular, there's obviously a, a long list of Vietnam War films that uh, are well worth your time, but this is one that really highlights the struggle that soldiers faced as they returned um, from the Vietnam War. There's another uh, film that, that deals with the what African Americans struggled with as they returned from war, and that is, uh, the film is called Dead Presidents. Here we have the Vietnam War Memorial, which was designed by a South Vietnamese student from Yale. There's a great deal of controversy over this monument. The reason that it is designed the way it is is that it shows an open knife wound through the nation. And if you go through and you take a look at the names um, along the reflection wall, the names are not in alphabetical order. They're, the names are listed in the order in which the soldiers and medical personnel, many of which were women and nurses, that were killed in action. The internal problems that caused the collapse of the Soviet Union to bring about an end to the Cold War, increasing Soviet military expenses to compete with the United States, rising nationalism in the Soviet republics, notably the Eastern Bloc, fast-paced reforms like uh, capitalistic market economy, and then economic inefficiency, notably the uh, disaster in, in the early 1980s known as Chernobyl, which was a uh, nuclear meltdown that cost the Soviet Union not only in the loss of lives, but it cost them uh, financially. I mean, it was It was a horrific event for human and monetary cost. We'll talk more about Chernobyl as we move into the, rep, the end of the semester. Gorbachev's policy um, was glasnost and perestroika. So Gorbachev will be the Soviet premier after Brezhnev. Um, and what glasnost was all about was openness in, in uh, and with more free speech and free press, not on the level of American free speech and free press, but also openness for diplomacy and dialogue. But we have to really point back to Nixon um, because Nixon started that open dialogue and, and, and international sort of diplomacy during his term, uh, not only by visiting China and Mao Zedong, but also visiting the Soviet Union and Brezhnev before Gorbachev's time. And then, of course, Perestroika was restructuring the economy to move toward 
capitalism and, and international trade. Here we have Mikhail Gorbachev, Soviet premier, following Brezhnev, who brought about an end to the Cold War. President Ronald Reagan's role in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Reagan was responsible for the SDI, Star Wars program, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which was a plan to militarily outspend the Soviets. Um, it was a satellite program that would have the ability to prevent Soviet nuclear attacks. It was um, half real and half propaganda, um, but nevertheless, this particular program was actually in the works and it did put economic pressure on the Soviet Union. We'll talk more about SDI as we move forward when we get into the Reagan era. Challenged the moral legitimacy of the Soviet Union, encouraged the Soviets to reunite East and West Germany. Reagan will famously give the speech at Brandenburg Gate for uh, Mr. Gorbachev to tear down this wall, the Berlin Wall. It increased U.S. military and economic pressure on the Soviet Union and a sharp rise in U.S. defense spending. Here we have Ronald Reagan at Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, and you can see the Berlin Wall behind him. And that is where we stop for the hot zones of the Cold War. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Have a great day.